Ms Nicola Mellon has given notice of an urgent oral question to the First Minister and Deputy First Minister. I would remind members that if they wish to ask a supplementary question, they should rise continually in their places. The member who tabled the question will be called automatically to ask a supplementary. Clark, can you please read the motion? To ask the First Minister and Deputy First Minister what audit has been carried out by the Executive Office on all aspects of the Social Investment Fund to date. I call the Deputy First Minister. Uh, all uh, organisations in receipt of departmental funding are subject to governance and financial management checks to ensure their capability to manage public money. This includes, firstly, a review of the organisational structure to ensure that a board and appropriate management structures are in place, and secondly, a review of the financial and governance processes to ensure the necessary policies and procedures to manage and account for funding are in place and implemented effectively. This process involves on-site visits and ongoing verification throughout the duration of the project to ensure compliance with policies and implementation of the necessary checks to account for all expenditure. Full checking and validating of spend by lead partners is carried out by the Department, which includes supporting evidence of costs incurred and payments made. The Social Investment Fund programme is also subject to normal internal and external audits, which include sample auditing of individual project spend. I call Ms Nicola Mellon for a supplementary. Madam uh, Deputy Principal Speaker, um, can I ask the Deputy First Minister, is he completely satisfied that no conflict of interest exists within Charter NI or any other organisation funded by the Social Investment Fund? Well, I think the, the, the whole issue of conflict of interest was, was something that uh, was dealt with by the, uh, by the student groups. And what we have to remember is that the Social Investment Fund is very much community-led. And given the focus on the community developing and prioritising projects to address local needs, a process to manage any conflicts of interest was put in place. Student group members were required to declare conflicts of interest when potential projects were being proposed. And where a conflict was declared, the student group member was not permitted to be involved in any discussion or decision around the prioritisation of the proposal. Student group members involved in the procurement of service delivery organisations were required to declare any conflict of interest in relation to those bidding. If a conflict was declared, the member was no longer involved in the tender and evaluation process to select a preferred bidder. Procurement was in accordance with the uh, public procurement policy, and the social investment fund money is provided to organisations who are working for the benefits of the community, and no individuals benefit financially. So I think it's very, very clear that uh, this was dealt with during the course of the work of the student groups. I call Mike Nesbitt. Uh, I thank you. The, the Minister makes much of normal checks being carried out by his department on governance and financial arrangements, and yet it is clear his department has no central registry of which members of the advisory panels attended which meetings. Such a simple thing, not Can even the held by the executive question, office. Please. Is that, in his opinion, good scrutiny? Well, I, th I think that in my original answer, I've, I've made it clear that uh, the governance of, of this entire process from the very beginning uh, is one that uh, we can be satisfied with. And you know, I'd like to remind the member that during the course of the initial stages of all of this, coming to fruition, that the member was chair of the OFM-DFM committee, which discussed this matter. And uh, all I can remember from that was the criticisms, which were legitimate at the time, about given it was a new process, the length of time that this was taken to bring to fruition. Never at any stage, never at any stage, was there anything from this member about the uh, controversy that has erupted in the course of recent times. And, and the questions now being asked about the governance of, of the process, the, the, the entire process was the most consulted. It was the most consulted process imaginable. Representatives of the members' own party sat on the steering groups, and I haven't heard during the course of the last number of years any of the criticisms that are now being voiced 
and which are only being voiced as a result of the, I suppose, legitimate controversy that has erupted over Mr Stitt in East Belfast? I call Christopher Stalford. Further to the question from the Leader of the Ulster Unionist Party, could the Deputy First Minister confirm that his constituency colleague, Mr Philip Smith, sat on a SIF steering group and that Ulster Unionist councillors, including Ulster Unionist councillors in South Can Belfast, the to also did? So if there was a lack of scrutiny in the process, the Ulster Unionist Party must take its fair share of the blame in that regard. Yes, I, I, can, I can confirm what the member has uh, just said, and it, it was quite obvious to everybody from the very beginning that uh, representatives of all of the major political parties in this assembly were participating in the steering groups and participating in many of the decisions. Indeed, all of, all of the decisions that were being made by the steering group in relation to the uh, way in which this process was to be taken forward, which everybody needs to remember was agreed from the very beginning and agreed by everybody. Here I'm Sir Raymond McCartney. I call Raymond McCartney. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Principal Deputy Speaker. Uh, can I ask the Minister, and obviously represent the constituency, whether there are a number of these projects on the ground doing valuable work, can he confirm that many of these projects have now moved into delivery phase? And will he take this opportunity today to reassure them, despite the sort of some of the claims and some of the suggestions being made by particularly people who call themselves the opposition, that none of these projects will be halted. Indeed, it will create more food opportunities for members of the opposition in the future. Be before I call the Deputy First Minister, can I remind members to keep their questions brief? Deputy. Well, I think I mentioned this earlier under the Executive Office question time, the fact that uh, there was concern within different projects and different areas and different steering groups that the uh, finances as a result of the controversy over uh, what's happening in East Belfast will be halted to the other groups. I want to absolutely dispel any notion whatsoever that we are going to call a halt to any of these other SIF projects. These projects in many instances are up and running, providing valuable uh, contributions to tackling uh, disadvantage and marginalisation in local communities. And I think it's very, very important that we give that reassurance here today. These are projects which are delivering incredibly for people who are trying to find pathways into employment, delivering on educational issues, on supporting families, uh, a wide range of other issues which uh, we can absolutely stand over and have no concern about whatsoever. And I think it is unfortunate as a result of the debate around Mr Stitt that we end up with some of the opposition parties actually calling into question what is happening in all our communities throughout the North. I think that's very unfair. Aaron, sir, Claire Hanna. I called Claire Hanna. Uh, thank you. The Deputy First Minister refers to a register in which steering group members declared uh, their interest and recused themselves from decision making. Where and when will this register be placed in the public domain? Well, that, that will be decided uh, very, very shortly. We're obviously very conscious of the uh, discussions around uh, many of these issues, including, for example, it question be raised as to whether or not minutes were be taken in relation to East Belfast. My understanding is that minutes uh, were taken, and I think uh, a decision will be made in the time ahead, both in relation to the minutes and the uh, issue that the member has just mentioned. I call Naomi Long. Madam Principal, Deputy Speaker, the Deputy First Minister cannot claim um, that he wasn't aware of my party's uh, concerns about the SIF fund because they're on the record um, from many years ago. However, perhaps he can answer this specific question. GEMS is the larger, more experienced organisation when it comes to managing and delivering community-based employability schemes. Can he explain precisely what added value for the management fee that Charter NI are paid, what this smaller and less experienced organisation are actually bringing to the project? Well, I, I think all, all of that is obviously a, an interesting conversation to have. At the end of the day, what I have outlined in my initial contribution to answering the question from uh, the member from North Belfast was a complete breakdown of how all of this is audited and how we as a government uh, are satisfied that uh, and, and in fact, there, there actually hasn't been an allegation from, from anybody, even in the opposition, that uh, one pound of the 1.7 million was misappropriated in any way. 
There has not been an allegation whatsoever. And indeed, uh, from, from our perspective as we go forward, we work, for, we work forward on the basis that if there are specific allegations, if there are specific allegations to be made, people should make the allegation and we can then have them investigated. And if there needs to be, and if there then needs to be a police investigation, we can ensure... Well, I think it is exactly what you asked. Can I, can, I, can I ask the member not to intervene from a sedentary position? Thank you. Aram, sir, or Eamon McCann. I call Eamon McCann. Thank you, uh, Madam Deputy Speaker. Uh, be, I fully accept sir, that there hasn't been a wing of money lost. Not a wing, sir, but the 1.7 million quid. But my question is this. I mean, that uh, this debate and controversy has been sparked by the case of Mr D. Uh, uh, Stitt and the question whether uh, he was an appropriate person to be employed at public expense by Charter Northern Ireland despite his alleged paramilitary role. Isn't it the case that he was employed in this position at public expense not despite his paramilitary role but because of his paramilitary role and that this reflects British government policy effectively endorsed by the executive which amounts to paying public and money to buy can paramilitaries I off? the member that questions need to be brief? Well, I, I, I don't accept uh, that argument at all. I mean, there, there are many SIF projects right throughout the North, and I would challenge anybody to. And I remember at, at the time of some controversy around this issue, somebody saw a headline in the Irish News that this was a slush fund for paramilitaries. Well, where are all these paramilitaries? Yes, we could talk about these, did. And uh, the basis on which he was employed by uh, Charter NI is, is really a matter for Charter NI. It's got absolutely nothing to do with this executive or with the British government. This was a scheme that the British government had no involved in, involvement in whatsoever. This was a scheme brought forward by our executive on the basis that this would deliver substantial gains for marginalised, disadvantaged uh, communities. And it is, the scheme is doing that right throughout the North. In this one instance, yes, we have a controversy, and the controversy resides around, uh, basically, in my view, the ridiculous, uh, almost laughable interview given by Mr. Stitt to the Guardian newspaper, which, which did uh, bring him into public ridicule, and by doing so, created massive problems for Charter NI, and indeed, we end up having to discuss it here today as a result of that controversy. But uh, the member is absolutely wrong. This is a great scheme. This is a scheme that's delivering on the ground, including the member's own constituency. And uh, I again dispel the notion that we're going to freeze this scheme. This scheme will continue until such times as the £80 million is spent productively in the interests of communities. I call Stephen Agnew. Aaron Sir Stephen Agnew. Thank you, Principal Deputy Speaker. It is intolerable that those who wish to wear suits by day and balaclavas by night um, be paid out of public funds. What lessons have been learned from this fiasco to ensure that the First and Deputy First Minister will have the power in future to act if such a circumstance was to arise again? Well, I, I suppose that's one of the more positive points that has been made during the course of this conversation uh, this afternoon. Uh, obviously, lessons will have to be learned. But at the same time, uh, I think I have to place on uh, the public record that there are many people who were formerly associated with the UDA, and there may even be people out there who are associated with the UDA, who have made very powerful and positive contributions to peacemaking and to the, the work of reconciliation. And uh, there are many people also with an Irish republicanism who also make very positive contributions to peacemaking and reconciliation. And I think it is important that as we go forward, we don't, uh, if, if, if you like, uh, try to use the situation in relation to Mr. Stitt to call into question the motivation of many, many good people who have for many years, indeed in some instances for decades, have bought into supporting uh, this peace process. So I think cheap shots don't work. What we have to do, deal with is the real politic of how we resolve conflict and how we try to involve as many people as possible in the resolution of conflict. And if that means working with people who were former paramilitaries, or who, who might even be associated with 
the UDS that the allegation has made in the course of recent times, but who are making a positive contribution and who are not involved in violence or criminality of any description. And I think it's very important that we do that. I call Jim Allister. Isn't this a mess of the executive's own making because of its rejection of open competition in the appointment of lead partners? And on the question whether it's a swish fund, could we have an audit of how many paramilitary convicts are on the SIF payroll, including from the Deputy First Minister's IRA fold? And the Deputy First Minister can choose which question well, to answer. Well, uh, as usual, the, the contribution made by this member isn't worth an answer. I call Emma Little Pengelly. Thank you. Can the Deputy First Minister confirm that, in relation to the structures and the processes of the Social Investment Fund, that these were cleared and went through and satisfied a full business case process? They were cleared by the accounting officer of the department. They were cleared independently from the department by the Department for Finance and Personnel. And they were periodically reviewed throughout the process of policy development by the exemplar, public sector ex exemplar gateway review process. Yeah. I uh, absolutely agree with the member, uh, what, and what's more, all of this was well known within this assembly. Aaron, sir, Oliver McMullen. I call Oliver McMullen. Does the minister believe that the SIFT delivery model represents a unique and innovative delivery model to tackle disadvantage? Yes, I, I, I do believe it is. I think that uh, from, from the very beginning we were very determined that this would not be a top-down process, that this was an opportunity for people in local communities to identify a series of projects which would be funded by the SIF project to enhance and enrich the lives of the people uh, that they lived among. And, and I think it has been a, a tremendous success. Apart from the, the difficulties around delays and the length of time it took for, for what was a new and innovative project, there is absolutely no question or doubt whatsoever that the SIF project is delivering uh, fantastic worthwhile benefits to local marginalised and disadvantaged communities right throughout the north. I call Sinead Bradley. Aaron, sir, Sinead Thank Bradley. Thank you, Madam Principal Deputy Speaker. Um, may I ask the Deputy First Minister, considering his continued confidence in the governance of the SIF fund, despite the the serious questions that have been raised in this House and elsewhere. Could the Minister therefore tell me when he intends to publish a full list of all organisations who applied to the SIF fund, all those who did receive money from it, and how much they received? Well, uh, when the member says serious questions about this fund, the even the governance of the fund, the reality is that we're only talking about this today because of a situation that developed over one person in East Belfast. Let's not use that to cast aspersions on the many, many other good people throughout the north of Ireland who are making fantastic contributions towards enriching the lives of the people that they represent. In relation to the second aspect of the uh, contribution made by the member, obviously we will take into consideration what has been said in terms of how we uh, deal with that in the time ahead. Uh, I, I have no principal opposition to full transparency in relation to this project. I call Stephen Farry. Whenever I was Minister for Employment and Learning, we funded GEMS through three different strands of money uh, to deliver community-based employment programmes without any difficulties. By contrast, whenever we funded Charter, we did, we did have the management difficulties. Question, Can I therefore ask the, the Minister to actually answer Naomi Long's question? What value added is provided by Charter, the smaller organisation, doing a management fee to manage GEMS, a larger and more experienced organisation? Well, I, I think uh, in terms of the work that uh, Charter and I have been doing, one thing that changed through from all of the controversy that has been about this in the course of recent time is that nobody has called into question uh, Charter and I's uh, motivation in all of this. In fact, all I hear from radio programmes is that nobody's casting aspersions on Charter and I, that they do a fantastic job that they deliver for the local community. And of course, they are involved in the employability schemes in East Belfast. So whatever about what happened previously, in relation to how uh, Charter and I have conducted their affairs, apart from the controversy around Mr. Stitt, nobody that I have heard 
has raised any questions whatsoever about Charter NI's contribution towards enriching the lives of people in East Belfast through the different projects, including important deployability projects in that area. Aram Sir Declan McAleer. I call Declan McAleer. Can the Minister give his reassurance that the Social Investment Fund has been delivered as intended? Yes, I absolutely do believe that the Social Investment Fund has been delivered as intended, apart from the controversy in East Belfast. There, there is no question or doubt about it that from the very beginning of this process, and I guess some individual members of the Alliance Party uh, certainly did voice opinions at the, at the very beginning, but uh, I heard you know, very little from the OFM-DFM committee, which obviously looked at this process from the very beginning and who obviously declared themselves satisfied with the uh, consultation that took place and the transparency that was clearly there in relation to what was a unique process, a process of trying to empower local communities to decide for themselves what best may, met their needs. That concludes this item of business. Can, can members take their ease while we change the table? Point of order. Could I ask, um, Madam Principal Deputy Speaker, if you would review the Hansard. Uh, Standing Order uh, 19.5 says that members who, who ask legitimate questions are to receive full answers to their questions. At no time during this session did I receive an answer to the substantive question that I put to the Deputy First Minister. And under 19.5, some of your colleagues are, I think, trying to use up your role, but under 19.5 of Standing orders that says that I'm entitled to a full response. I would be grateful if you would review the Hansard to ensure that if I haven't received it or if I misunderstood that, that that can be clarified and if I haven't received it that I will in writing. Well the member is an experienced politician and she's been here for a long time and she's well aware that's not a point of order. She's also, she's, she's also aware that it is up to the Deputy First Minister to answer as he sees fit. So that this is not a point of order, but the member has had an opportunity to put her concerns on record. Point of order. Could you perhaps explain to the House how when a member quotes standing orders at you, you can say that that is not a point of order? It clearly is a point of order under any possible terms. Well, I've, I've made uh, my decision in relation to that, and we will now move on. I would ask that members take their ease. I would ask that members take their ease and we will uh, change the top table. The point of order, Mr Nesbitt. Thank you very much. The, uh, Mr McGuinness used the, the session uh, to imply that some of the criticisms of SIF uh, from parties such as mine were new and therefore by implication to some extent opportunistic. Uh, SIF was published in September 2011 before the calendar year was out. The Ulster Unionist Party had published a response to the consultation containing our critiques and our concerns, mainly the chief concern over the exercise of control by OFM DFM. I appreciate the opportunity to balance the official record. The member's comments are noted, but that isn't a point of order, as he well knows. Thank you. Point of order. Uh, thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Um, given the uh, statement made by the uh, Speaker to the House this morning, uh, could I ask you to go and consult with the Speaker and with the Deputy Speakers in relation to the ruling that you've made arising from the point of order raised by Neil Belong? This is a matter about the accountability to the uh, Assembly understanding orders. It's a matter that you should discuss with the Speaker and with the Deputy Speakers, something that hasn't happened in the past. The Member has also made his uh had the opportunity to make his comment on the floor of the House here. We will Perhaps when, if the Speaker is reviewing it, there were two former ministers who spoke here today. Perhaps we can have some record, perhaps in the past, where they were accused of not answering questions at question time. <laughs> and that isn't a point of order either. We must move on. Further to the point of order I made, are you saying to this House, Madam Deputy Speaker, that you are not going to consult with the Speaker as to the proper interpretation of standing orders?
the Speaker has already written to all ministers on the executive to remind them about the importance of replying. Point of order, Mr. Stalford. Madam Principal Deputy Speaker, I am a, a new member here and I don't have a copy of the standing orders in front of me. Perhaps you could direct me to the standing orders where it states that the ruling of the chair in matters of debate and procedure is final. Certainly, the matter of the chair is final. Um, point of order, Mr. Brad uh, Sinead Bradley. Thank you, Madam Principal, Deputy Speaker. Also, as a new member, and further to um, the member's previous contribution, could we then be communicated with if there has been, based on this decision, a change to my understanding of the point of order that was there raised has by been, <laughs> There has been no change, and we will move on. I'm not taking any further points of order. Can members take their ease while we change the table?